Good evening. Uh, we get to celebrate communion on this Resurrection Sunday, which uh, probably seems a little backwards since Greg just preached on the Resurrection, and now we're going to be focusing back on the cross, which he preached like an hour sermon on last week. But as Greg pointed out last week, uh, what Christ did for us on the cross is the core of our faith. It is not something that we intellectually graduate from or hopefully ever grow tired of hearing or thinking about. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And we're going to take this time to once again look at Christ crucified and His work upon the cross. We're going to be in Romans 5 if you want to begin making your way there. Romans was written by Paul and in it he introduces himself to them expresses his desire to see them in person and ask for their support, all the while thoroughly preaching the gospel to them. And in the first four chapters, Paul has shown that both Jew and Greek are sinners under the wrath of God, that by works no one will be justified, and, but rather we are counted as righteous through faith. And at the beginning of chapter 5, he's telling them the results of their justification, including that they have hope that does not disappoint due to the love of God. And that brings us to the text that we will be focusing on, so please follow along with me, starting in verse 6 of Romans 5. For while we are still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're going to quickly look at the when, the who, the who and the why of Christ's death on the cross. First, the when. You see in verse 6 and verse 8, the phrase, while we were, is used. And both times, it doesn't end on a positive note. It isn't while we were strong and self-dependent or while we were already righteous. Rather, it ends with while we are weak or helpless in verse 6, depending on what translation you have in your Bible, and while we were sinners in verse 8. There's no amount of life cleansing or self-help that could have prompted Jesus to come and die for our sin. Instead, verse 6 tells us that it was at the right time or the exact time God in his sovereignty had chosen in redemptive history. It was then that Christ took on flesh and went to die on the cross, a choice that was completely out of the control of sinful man. And this leads us to our second point, which is the who of Christ's death. Who did Christ die for? Well, we've briefly mentioned two of these descriptors, the weak or helpless seen at the beginning of verse 6, and then sinners seen in verse 8. But we also find at the end of verse 6 that Christ died for the ungodly. This word can also mean godless, and Peter uses it three times in 2 Peter, twice in chapter 2 when describing the world before the flood, and the lifestyle of those in Sodom and Gomorrah, and then again in chapter 3, verse 7, where he writes, but by his word, that is God's word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So we can clearly see that this word ungodly is very serious, and I think it's important to note that before we are saved, in our sin we are not neutral with God as if our relationship with him is comparable to that of a friend or an acquaintance that we've fallen out of touch with. We would run into, and you know, we'd be friends with him. We just don't talk as much anymore. I'm sure if I ran into him at Walmart, we'd be friendly. We could maybe get coffee, talk about our kids. No, it's not like that at all. But rather, if you look at Romans 5, verse 10, you'll find another one of these while we were statements. And this one says, while we were enemies. Before we are saved, we are ungodly and enemies of God because he created us to praise him and glorify him as he deserves, but we've instead turned from him to worship anything but him. And usually this results in us worshiping ourselves. Quickly think back to Eve and the serpent in the garden. The serpent tells her that God is a liar and surely she will not die if she eats from the tree the knowledge of good and evil, but rather she will be like God. So... She takes and eats. And that Christ died for the ungodly, the godless, sinners who worship themselves or the creature rather than the creator, makes the third point, the why, so remarkable. 
Lastly, let's look at the why. We find this in verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ's death on the cross is God's ultimate expression of his love for us. Verse 7 helps flesh out how astonishing this love of God is. We see in it that one will hardly or with great difficulty die for a righteous man, though perhaps one would dare even venture to die for a good man. But Paul has already established in the first three chapters of this letter that there is none righteous, not even one. So we do not classify as a righteous or a good man, but rather as unrighteous, ungodly sinners. We need to see our sin as David does when he writes in Psalm 51, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, that is God, you only I have sinned and done evil in your sight. In light of this, it's incredible how verse 8 begins. But God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that Christ died for sinners. Our sin is against God, yet God is the one who saves us from the penalty of our sins. And he has done this through the death of Christ on the cross. With this in mind, it makes sense why Paul places this here within his letter. In verse 5, Paul writes, And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So naturally, the next thing he does is proclaim the greatest demonstration of God's love for us, which is Christ's death on the cross. His death that bore the wrath of God that we deserve for our sin His death that results in us standing holy and blameless before God clothed in his righteousness. His death that gives us the great joy of looking forward to the day when we will drink of the fruit of the vine with him in eternity. So as we come to communion here in a few moments, think upon Christ's death on the cross that occurred at the right time while we were completely undeserving for the ungodly, for the weak and helpless sinner, all to demonstrate God's love for us. Here at Anchor Bible Church, we practice open communion, meaning that the bread and the cup and remembrance are for all those who have placed their faith in Christ, regardless if you are a member at this church. So if you've repented and believed in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross for the salvation from your sins, then this communion is open for you to partake in.